Okay, thank you. Then I, I do my best to embarrass you back. And, uh, here we shut the door. Um, so the reason why it's such a great pleasure to come here is that for some reason we happen to be somehow circulating on the same morphogenetic circle. So whenever I think about something that would be worth thinking about, I usually get a call from Zach and he says, wouldn't you like to speak about this? <laughs> Just that every second. And so in, in the past, first uh, he invited me to come speak about ghosts. Um, then just when I was getting more and more into animism and the idea of the animal and how to relate to the animal, Zach calls up and says, you know, I'm doing a class on animals, would you like to come? Uh, in the, in the summer, we were doing a, um, a residency project in Banff, where um, three of you were, Holly, Stacy, and David were also uh, participants, um, on the question of animism and mimeticism, mimetic magic. Uh, and in this class, we were trying to somehow push it to uh, a limit where the, the urge to mimic as magic as it is, would also relate to comedy, you know, like mimicking other people, uh, making impersonations uh, as, 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 a, as a backbone of comedy. And well, Zach calls me up that very minute and says, you know, would you like, I'm doing class on comedy. Uh, it's absolutely amazing, so I will have to try today to kind of go through this entire circle and relate comedy to magic and spiritism animals and ghosts and the modality which I believe makes comedy, magic and spiritism come very close uh, is the method of mimicry and imitation. Um, so basically that's, that's what this talk will be about. My ma the, the magic of mimeticism doing impersonations uh, and the question to what degree in the key of mimicking and, uh, Im uh, and impersonation. Um, on the one hand, we perform crisis management, so jokes, while at the same time plunging into something that is potentially no longer controllable. So I'm trying to slowly move it from the funny to the freaky. So that's the trajectory of, of the talk. No? In the first part, I want to kind of just go run through the circle um, from comedy um, through magic to spiritism, and then in the second part of the talk, uh, I want to discuss what forms of mimicry are still perceived as safe, and at what point impersonation starts to flip over into the key of the slightly kind of multiple personality disorder, freaky side of things. Um, the question is not really what is funny. It's, it's not uh, kind of a, an attempt to come up with a cookbook recipe for understanding what makes us laugh. It's more um, a question of what regions, what areas of psychological, social life, what realities, what twilight zones of reality are we actually entering and navigating uh, through humor, magic and spiritism. Because I'm claiming it's, it might be the same kind of social twilight zone that we get into whenever we mimic. Um, and the reason why I find this is amazingly interesting in relation both to, the, to all these questions. Now, how do we relate to ghosts? How do we relate to animals? How do we relate to that strange thing that makes us laugh? Um, I think it's all connected to a particular ambivalence and tension. No, it, it, both when it comes to animals, ghosts, and jokes, um, they always touch on something that we do not fully grasp or understand. And with ghosts, we don't even know whether they're there, but we still we feel a presence. So that's, that's, uh, that's strange, awkward. With animals, they're constantly around us, but we still don't know what they think. Uh, uh, and with jokes, it's usually the things that are most awkward, the kind of elephant we find in the corner, be it sex, class, race, all these things that are somehow in the space of which we know that there are presence, but for which there is no really acceptable protocol of how to deal with them, or at least the acceptable protocols for dealing with these issues, they somehow fall short 
of the way uh, we experience the presence of these issues. So there's, an, there's an elephant in the corner, there's an animal in the room, uh, there's a ghost in the attic. Now how do we relate to these things? Uh, when it's not even quite clear how they should be addressed, how they can be addressed, so the means are not already given, they are a subject to experimentation on the one hand, uh, and it's always also connected to somehow sidestepping the protocol when you make a joke instead of a different kind of using a different kind of address. But the strange thing about all these things, occultist seances, um, I don't know, living with an animal or making a joke is while you relate to something of which you don't understand what the relation is, the way you perform that relation is actually very concrete and practical. No? Like you call a ghost, yeah, okay, let's do it. You know, the best time to call the devil is at one o'clock on Monday night, and we get together and get the job done. We negotiate, what do you want me to do? Okay, kill my neighbor, okay, can it out. Yeah? So it's very pragmatic in the same way that the joke, while touching on something that might otherwise be unmentionable, is also strikingly concrete. You do it in two seconds and uh, you have it out there. No? So we experience a tension between that which is potentially unspeakable, unmentionable, not quite sure if it's there, but, but the presence is felt, uh, and on the other hand, the extreme pragmatism with which the, the joke is cracked, uh, the ghost is invoked, and you barter with the ghost, like, it, 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 like with the business partner, who are you, what can you tell me, I need this information. Um, um, and that is something that I find interesting, because to a certain degree, it's almost paradigmatic, I guess, also for the way how we relate to art. No, I guess in art, on the one hand, we constantly address things of which we cannot even verify that they exist, even though we feel them vividly. The great idea I had yesterday night, which feels kind of strange and, and on the morning after. Or, uh, all these things, we cannot even prove that art exists, for all we know. Or it might just be in our heads and we get together and claim that this thing exists. But at the same time, while it's strangely unverifiable, and vivid in our heads, but we, we, we still relate to it and perform, form a relationship to it on a very pragmatic level. No, I don't know if I'm talking to ghosts, but I'm just going to put that thing on canvas. Yeah. So on that level, I find I encounter something in jokes, ghosts and animals, where um, we find ourselves relating to the strangely intangible, but in a very concrete manner. No? Um, and. Uh, I, uh, Zach yesterday was, was saying that in the text that you previously discussed, it was all about this idea of we don't know what it is, but we're going to put it out there. And that's actually what I'm, what I'm trying to talk about. No? We don't know what it is, it might be this strange elephant in the corner, but nevertheless we're going to grab it and put it out there. Um, like you see here, I don't know what it is, but I pulled it out of the ground and I'm showing it to the camera. Yeah. In case you worry about this, uh, this is called a geoduck and they eat it in China. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Once, I, mean, I once walked into a restaurant in Vancouver and I had one, one of these things uh, in, in a fish tank and it, it just feels like you, I, <laughs> you, you didn't previously know of the existence of this, of this creature but they already offer it for you to dinner, yeah? uh, to, to you for dinner. <laughs> but but that's, that's what I'm trying to say. No, like these, these are these kind of strange entities that are always somewhat, they are the elephant in the corner, the, the, the ghost in the attic, but um, uh, Mentally, it's, it's too much for us, but physically, it's just something that you pull out of the ground. Apparently, that's how we do it. They, they, once in a while, they, they put their, their tentacle out of the ground, and that's where you pull, or pull them out and serve them for dinner. Yeah. Um, so, on a certain level, um, this is daily practice. No, we crack jokes, uh, we, uh, we play on these things. Um, it's, it's a constant negotiation uh, of desires. Um, for instance, also in correspondence with animals. Now, this is not what you think it is. It's a gyro, like down there. But this is a version of the gyro which is used to attract frogs. Because when you, uh, when you, when you have a pen, um, because when you kind of, uh, when you scratch it, 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 this particular one makes a, a kind of a sound that it, in, in South America is actually used to attract frogs. So, uh, here's another one. Uh, and when you can attract frogs, you can also perform an entire party. You know? but that's the beautiful thing um, about this form of practical animism. You relate to the animal spirits, but you relate to the spirits of the people. You relate to the, the joys of life uh, through an object 
of which on a certain level uh, you cannot say what it is that you're doing, but you're doing it anyway. Kind of a strange, obscene object that you relate to while performing um, um, which in, uh, something that in other situations can instantly also become a magical relationship. That's an, uh, an image from Michael Tausig's book, My Mises and Alterity, where um, on the one hand you see a, uh, uh, a turtle, like an imitation of a turtle that's used for hunting, for attracting turtles, in the same way that you would attract frogs with, the, um, with this evil thing. Uh, but, this, uh, but the same thing, the same shape here, is also used uh, for magical purposes. There, there is a practical side to the use of these things, but at the same time, uh, it, it just takes a short step from attracting the animal physically to eat it, to, to catch it, or conjuring up the animal spirit for healing and magical purposes. Um, you talk to the animal, you talk to the spirit, it's a very pragmatic operation, hunting and healing here uh, being part of the same um, cultural practice. Um, in Michael Tausig continues speaking about this uh, use of the mimetic, both in, in a practical sense and in a magical sense, as a fundamental knowledge of how to, re to relate to the world around you, which is uh, kept alive in many cultures around the world. Uh, so, for instance, um, this is a design from a poncho, like a molar, a scarf, a poncho, um, from the Kuna tribe, uh, which traditionally uses its ponchos to the skin that you wrap around yourself uh, to enter into some kind of mimetic relationship with the world. So here is the His Master's Voice uh, logo found on records, uh, a Western modern uh, uh, um, icon of mimetic relations transferred uh, onto the poncho that you can uh, uh, wear to keep yourself warm. So there is a, um, an invocation of the magic forces of the outside world, but in a very pragmatic key. Well, that's how mimetic magic works. Um, you speak to the animal by becoming the animal, by mimicking the animal, which is something that on the one hand we associate with tribal cultures, and at the same time, yeah, well, it's one of the pleasures uh, that we know so well when we imitate each other, when we get each other masks, or. Uh, one of the ba basic pleasures of child's play is to mimic, uh, to learn through imitation. Um, there's a beautiful text by Walter Benjamin called The Mimetic Faculty, where he argues that all forms, all higher faculties of the, of the, um, of the human mind, of, the, of uh, human culture, are based on the initial impulse to mimic, to imitate, and re relate to the world through, mimic, to, through mimicry, um, uh, which is an argument that Adorno then continues to unfold in his aesthetic theory, where he basically argues there is a fundamental level uh, uh, of magic to art which is absolutely unrepre uh, irrepressible. So whenever we think about art or imitation and art only in terms of representation, Adorno argues we're missing a fundamental point um, because the way there is a fundamental way level of which we relate in art to the world around us uh, through imitation, where art is the closest you can get to child's play when you put on the mask and you become the animal, you become the object that you're playing with. And Benjamin says, you know, the child doesn't just become another human being, it also becomes a train or a chair, so there is no limits to what you can become when you mimic and explore the world through that. And Adorno argues that in a modern scientific mindset, this very fluid, mercurial, open way of relating to the world around you through imitation as a form of becoming is constantly repressed for the sake uh, of some kind of strange idea of a more wholesome person that knows uh, where I end and the world begins, basically. You know? where, where you have a, a clear-cut idea of identity that forces you to repress a more fluid sense of being connected to the environment um, through all forms of play. And he basically, um, this is a beautiful quote from, from the aesthetic theory, where he says, um, 
In its clownishness, art consolingly recollects prehistory in the primordial world of animals. Apes in the zoo together perform what resembles clown routines. The collusion of children with clowns is a collusion with art, which adults drive out of them just as they drive out their collusion with animals. Human beings have not succeeded in so thoroughly repressing their likeness to animals that they are unable in an instant to recapture it and be flooded with joy. The language of little children and animals seems to be the same. In the similarity of clowns to animals, the likeness of humans to apes flashes up. The constellation animal, fool, clown is a fundamental layer of art. It's not a question whether this is scientifically correct, probably not, but um, the whole point is to say, like, okay, we find something in art where on a very practical level, we relate to something that surpasses a modern logic of identity and difference, you know? where we enter into some kind of strange collusion, a joyful collusion um, with uh, the animal. Um, What's your name? Frickin' Ralph. Why are your hands so freakishly big? I don't know. Why are you so freakishly annoying? Are you a hobo? Listen, I try to be nice. I'm nice. You're mimicking. You're mimicking me. That is rude, and this conversation is <laughs> Um, which is the joy of the collusion here, uh, which at the same time is also perceived as an insult, of course. No, that's the moment when, when uh, imitating, imitating other people produces laughter, but also tangibly oversteps the border. No? Like she, uh, this, it's Sarah Silverman voicing uh, Caroline von Schweetz, um, entering into this relationship with, uh, with Racket Valve. Um, on a very practical level, they, they make first contact, but which is ambivalent between uh, a moment of interplay, collusion, or like an insult. Or you never know where you're overstepping the line. Since we're in modern life, we're all supposed to be discrete personalities. And the moment I start imitating someone in the audience, uh, of course, I'm somehow uh, partially overstepping a line um, in the same moment that I'm freely relating to, to what I find uh, around me. So there is a level of comedy in it and a level of magic where you are invoking the spirits that are in the space through performing uh, a moment of likeness by becoming the animal, uh, invoking the animal spirit uh, through letting it, channeling it through your body by becoming that thing uh, that you talk to. Um, which is on the one hand the reason while we laugh, because we see that the person who imitates is not the person that's imitated, while if he's good at imitating, he comes dangerously close. So it's that kind of strange oscillation that is funny, but fundamentally, of course, it's also a spiritual affair, because you are channeling the spirit of that which you imitate. Um, and on that level, um, of course, the, the channeling, the becoming, the voicing, the, 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 posi the, the, the attempt to let the voice of the other come and speak through your body is essentially also a practice of mediumship. You know? If I uh, impersonate someone and try to speak with their voice, um, I'm articulating their spirit and letting it kind of speak through my, through my organs. So. Um, and, so on that level, a good impersonator is also almost like a spiritual medium, you know, lending his or her body uh, to the voice of something that goes uh, um, through this body. And on that level, the collusion with the spirit um, also sublates, suspends any clear difference between me and that other spirit. The medium that suddenly speaks with the voice of a spirit um, is it dispossessed of its soul in the moment when it becomes that channel? Um, or is it still itself? It's very unclear. You know? And in that sense, also potentially scary. Um, at the same time, while it's scary, of course, it can be the source of healing. You know? Because it's also the root of shamanism. Uh, when you call animal spirits and uh, you call up the spirits of the illness that you cure, uh, to uh, extract them from the body and to stage that kind of conflict of the spirits, uh, the vessel of which you become as the shaman. So the, the medium, the shaman, um, as, uh, as an agent 
of mimeticism, mimicking the forces into being that you need to conjure up to fight the illness, but which is usually as you fight fire with fire. It is the demons that make someone sick. You need to conjure them up to, to, to get them out of the body of the person who is currently possessed by them uh, and hence uh, sick. Uh, um, on that level, where the, um, the person who mimics and conjures up the spirit becomes a medium for that spirit, gives voice to that spirit, uh, the medium, the shaman, and the shaman have a, in modernity have a strong proximity to the hysteric. Because the, also the hysteric is someone who's briefly dispossessed of what might be his own persona and gives kind of voice to a multiplicity of personas. Yeah? Uh, there is one particularly famous hysteric in the history of modern psychology, um, which is Blanche Whitman, whom you see here, and the psychologist uh, um, Charcot. He had his, his Wednesday lecture sessions in, in, in Paris. And uh, he would always work together with Blanche uh, Whitman because Blanche Whitman had a unique talent in producing all desired symptoms like on the spot. Yeah. So uh, she would kind of on cue display all kinds of hysteric symptoms that were currently being discussed uh, and uh, faint uh, on demand and, and in that sense be a very co cooperative medium. Yeah. So, on that level, we realize that also modern science, the modern science of psychology, um, has a strong relationship um, to whatever we would associate otherwise with mediumship or shamanism. Also, the, um, the, um, the doctor here, um, who presents himself as a man of modern science to the colloquium uh, of people, mostly men, as you can see here, only men, who are there to uh, to understand what the symptom is, you know, what this what, what what the spirits are doing? Um, that's the big difference. You know that sh the shaman is the wounded healer, so the shaman has to go through the whole, has to kind of let the spirits that he's curing through his body to get them out. While in the modern discourse, uh, this role is split into two. Uh, you have the doctor who's sane and his kind of partner who performs whatever insanity is currently. Uh, needed to be exemplified, but it makes it clear that he's on top uh, while she is kind of channeling the spirit and thereby becoming the spirit. So everything that here is still in the zone of reality freaky, where in the moment of voicing the spirits, the identity of who you are as a medium or as a shaman at some point becomes ambivalent, in the discourse of modern science is split uh, into the person who's the patient, the exemplary patient who's possessed by the voices, by the spirits, um, and the healer who presents himself as this arbiter of uh, rationality, who's in control of the situation. Yeah. Um, and I can't help thinking that what we have here is, is the drama of the stand-up comedian. You know? Because uh, when you present yourself as a stand-up comedian, on the one hand, you have the ambition to relate to all the elephants that are currently in the corner. So you give, have to, 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 to kind of pull out everything that is currently unsayable and lend your body to all the voices uh, that can speak through you. Like all the characters, all the racists, bigots, whatever uh, happens to be currently shaping your society, you give a voice to them uh, in, in a performance that is very close to an exorcism, if you want. Um, but at the same time, of course, you uh, have to constantly signal that you're not just the person fainting on stage, producing all the pathologies of society on cue for an audience, uh, but you also have to say, like, uh, to suggest, no, um, actually, while you're performing whatever's freaky about the society that you live in, you're equally also in the position of Charcot, uh, the analyst, uh, who's on top of matters. No? That's why I think um, the traditional role model of, I think in America you call it the ham, no? the ham, the guy, the ham, will usually arrive on stage in a very chacot like outfit. Like, no, I'm, I'm a professional. I'm, I'm just wearing my stuff. Uh, uh, it's not me who's actually possessed. Yeah? It's society that's possessed. So when I'm performing the pathologies of society in grimacing, in, in imitating, my whole outfit will constantly suggest, you know, it's, it's, it's just me. 
You know, I'm, I'm not appearing with any freaky stuff on, on stage. Um, I, I'm the guy, uh, I'm Chico, I'm the analyst, and even if I temporarily slip into Blanche Whitman mode and produce all the symptoms, uh, it's still, I'm still Dylan Moran. No, I'm, I'm Dylan Moran, I'm the Irish guy who drinks on stage, uh, who's offensive, uh, but, but, but charming. And even if I speak, temporarily speak with the voice of a British bigot imitating a German talking like the typewriter typing on tinfoil being kicked down the stairs, it's still clear um, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm the dude. No? Even, even if I talk with the voice of a bigot, it's, it's actually not me. Um, so, uh, you know, he's, he's holding it out there, uh, but it's totally clear it's, it's just him, no? right? Um, so why, why, uh, the, the modern distribution of labor between pathology uh, and, and analysis, control and symptom is still somehow sustained even though he's performing. Yes, he is the witch doctor. He is the witch doctor, he is the medium. Uh, who can kind of bring up all these voices and embody all those voices, but um, we shouldn't be scared, uh, it's just him. No? So it's the, uh, basically, uh, as a stand-up comedian, you wrestle the octopus, uh, but you make sure that everybody understands you are not the octopus. Yeah? You engage the grotesque, um, but you engage the grotesque with a particular form of laughter and outfit that makes it clear that even if you temporarily turn into this creature, there's always a way back, so the audience shouldn't panic. Yeah? Like a famous uh, uh, exception to the rule, of course, is Andy Kaufman. Uh, someone like Andy Kaufman who suddenly really turns into someone who could easily be a loose cannon because you can no longer locate the difference between the joke and the person. You know? um, but I'll get back to that in the end of the talk. So, but I, I mean, as much as I love Bill and Morin, but it, 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 I think many, many, uh, male stand-up comedians, um, in the way how they present themselves, uh, they do this octopus wrestling, and to make it clear that even if they temporarily turn into an octopus, a psychic octopus, uh, it's safe, no? because they're still on top of it, they're wrestling the beast, they're not actually becoming the beast. Yeah? So, um, uh, a witch doctor who's actually also kind of a professional on the joke, uh, catching the ghost, uh, of course, being drawn into uh, the mess that the spirits produce, but at the same time, uh, we shouldn't be afraid if there's anything strange in your neighborhood, you call the Ghostbusters, because they somehow take care, they, they manage the situation. Yeah? Um, which I think um, is still the better alternative, let's say, to the military or the police, yeah? because there's different ways of handling crisis in a society, and I believe that uh, the um, the, the, the stand-up comedian makes it clear that society is in crisis, but he, while he tries to control the crisis through humor, he still makes it clear that he's in the crisis with everybody else. No? Managing it, no credit today, tomorrow, no problem. We're, we're in the mess together, but you know, like the joke will get us by. Uh, it's, it's a survival strategy. No? And in that sense, uh, I do think, I mean, Steve Colbert, the, the great thing is that at the moment in the, in the Bush era, you have someone trying to stem crisis with force while producing it you know, through the military, and then the other president, uh, other people running the Daily Show, basically saying, yes, we know that we're in crisis, we're currently making it, yeah? but there, there must be another way to handle it than dropping bombs on other people. Like, you know. So on, on that level, I feel like comedy is a very powerful crisis management strategy. Um, as it should suggest, yes, I can produce all the symptoms and I'm aware of the pathologies, I can reproduce them, um, but at the same time, in the act of reproducing it, I'm still the ham on stage, uh, I don't have to be the president of the military, I can be the ham on stage, but still, you know, I'm wrestling the octopus. Yeah? So in that sense, um, I would say I'm, I'm all for um, these presidents of crisis management. Um, the question is only um, if to some degree this kind of way of wrestling the octopus is still trying to pull the octopus out of the deep seas, out of the twilight zones of kind of uh, spirits uh, and, uh, and demons onto the land to say like, you know, at the end it's just me, you're, you're safe, it's fine. What if we would let go 
of that uh, moment of bringing, of anchoring the whole discourse in the kind of solid body of the ham? What if we would fully plunge into this kind of critical zone where the spirits talk to each other and the forces uh, conjoin in strange ways that can no longer be clearly controlled according to the logic of identity and difference? When we fully fall into this kind of uh, realm where multiplicity of forces and spirits are at play, which traditionally, yes, is the realm of uh, comedy and tragedy. You know, the, all the, the temperaments and elements of the human soul uh, as they play themselves out. And uh, of course, both comedy and psychology in modern times are heirs to a much older understanding of the human soul uh, in medicine and magic, uh, where what we're dealing with, or what is systematized later in modern psychology and humor, um, is uh, types. So I guess also a modern stand-up comedian works with typecasting. No, imitating is based on I have certain types in my neighborhood and I, I can, can turn them into characters and perform them. The, uh, the history of that arguably um, is uh, the history of um, character types in uh, the understanding of the elements and the temperaments and the humors. That's originally where humor comes from. Humor is the, the liquids that you have in your body. So uh, if we have the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water, um, each of these elements is uh, uh, linked to a particular planet. This planet talks to a particular part of your body and a particular humor. So the air uh, and the planet of Jupiter talk to your blood. Uh, very good in spring right now, if, 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 if it finally starts happening. Uh, water is linked to Venus. It produces phlegma. That's the temperament of phlegma associated with winter. Saturn is linked to Earth. The black bile as a humor, as a juice in your body, um, which turns you into, wait, am I messing this up? Uh, phlegmatic is water. I think, of course, like the, uh, the melancholic, the, the person who becomes the melancholic because his black bile is very dominant, is the person born in winter or under the, all melancholics are, under this, are born under the sign of Saturn so that the cult of melancholia is also linked to the planet of Saturn. You can find that in the Dura um, melancholia as well. Um, fire, summer, is bile, the planet of Mars, and it's the sanguinic, someone who's very lively. So this is the old kind of, um, these are the humors, the humors that of course give you character type casts. Yeah? Every planet, every humor gives you a particular type, uh, the phlegmatic, the choleric, uh, the sanguinic and the melancholic. So here, this is, and this is not just the basis for, I don't know, caricature, the origin of the, the grimace, where you can, uh, you can, you can perform, uh, perform a choleric, a phlegmatic, a sanguinic and melancholic because they're naturally, natu na naturally born caricatures, but they also, of course, link to, uh, to medicine. So if, if you have a problem with melancholia, that means there's a particular juice in your body that is dominant, and so you need to kind of get your juices in the right order so that you cure melancholy. Apparently, rose leaves were good against melancholy and also a lot of, you know, exercise in the open air. There were even like these theories, uh, uh, for instance, reading would cause melancholy because you squash your stomach and that gets the bile in disorder and that makes you, makes you melancholic. Yeah, so read less kind of in an upright position. So um, on that level, the, the curing business, the shaman, you know, the doctor, the doctor that talks to the demons, the doctor that talks to the juices, the doctor that talks to the humors, um, is the person that cures you because he understands your spirit and your humors, which are the humors which are the juices in your body, and he, uh, he knows to kind of put them in order. In the same way that this is the, the basis for modern psychology, if you will, modern and, and modern caricature, uh, based on the theory of the elements uh, and humors. So all of these things basically are understood uh, in the light of elementary medicine, and you can do kind of you can perform comedy with it, medicine. Uh, but if you want, you can also use it for alchemical purposes, of course. Yeah? Um, so. 
this is if you want the common link between uh, magic, spiritism, and comedy in the ancient understanding of what the humors do. Um, you can organize the humors. Uh, you can put them all into its pro into, into their proper order and proper balance. But what happens if the humors get imbalanced? If things get really messy? Um, in the sense, for instance, like you have a multiple personality disorder, you can no longer say, okay, okay this is this type, this is that type. We, we can clearly identify who she is because she is suddenly many things. Yeah? Uh, and that is the threat to a logic of identity, a threat to a logic of order, which traditionally in a patriarchal society uh, is usually projected on everybody who's subaltern as a threat to the dominant notion of identity. And hence, of course, it's no coincidence that the person who gets dragged out as a professional hysteric should be female. You know? like the preserver of the order of identity, male, and the projection of a threat to this order of identity uh, on the woman, because in a patriarchal society, traditionally, men are unsure what's happening over in this department. Uh, so like, we do not know who she is. We do not know what she wants. She's scary. No, we cannot put her into a clear position in the order of the, the elements uh, because she seems to be fluid, uh, because she can present different images of herself, she can give voice to different spirits, um, because she's linked to the mirror. She is uh, she's someone who can reflect, she is someone who can mimic, uh, and we do not understand the difference between the woman who mimics uh, and what the woman herself is. Though there is a traditional um, misogynist assumption that uh, since women are so much oriented towards the social, they do not have a clearly distinguishable sense of identity. They are the mirror. So the moment when tra traditionally um, the uh, identity of a woman is drawn into doubt, it is associated with a moment of, if you will, radical mimeticism. Someone who kind of cannot be trusted because she's only a mirror image. She's only mimicking. Uh, she is only a reflection of the desires of others. Um, this is the famous or infamous, if you will, portrait by Velasquez down there, which radically brings that po point home. There is nothing behind the mirror. She is the mirror. You know, like the, or there isn't the difference between identity, or, uh, originality, and mirror image is suspended because the first, the primary look you get from her is actually through the mirror. Um, it's, it's always difficult when you summarize stereotypes that obviously I, I, don't, I don't believe in that, but it's, it's, it's one of the, a strong, it's a strong cultural motif uh, that locates the crisis of identity in the persona of, as of the woman and usually in the key of someone whose identity is fundamentally instable because she's uh, completely dedicated uh, or possessed uh, by the spirit of imitation. Um, so there is no ham in this picture here anymore. No, like the ham, the ham can't put it right. Uh, we have somebody who's thrown into a, a, a crisis of, uh, uh, of mimicking, of mirroring, that finds no stable ground anymore. Um, which is what I now, in this last part of the talk, I just want to run with that. To say, yes, it's okay if we have a ham to manage the crisis, still better than the authorities. Uh, but what if we plunge fully in an understanding of unlimited mimicry and mimesis? And in the discourse of modernity, that brings us close to the hysteric, as somebody who performs multiple personalities and unli unlimited mimesis, if you will. So, um, and with this idea of unbridled mimesis as something that can be equally funny and freaky, uh, I want to now uh, run through a final series of clips to, if you will, challenge the ham uh, with this notion of uh, first step, Marx Brothers, Duck Soup, Mirror Scene. Yeah?
still relatively stable on the level of we know it's Groucho and even though it's the, everybody's imitating him we still understand there is a trademark sign of identity, it's the moustache so there is a rela relationship of identity and difference, it's still relatively stable even though of course what it's played on is kind of false nicety and a kind of a social competitiveness how are you, how are you, how can I find out something about you that makes you feel that, that could make you feel bad uh, but it's like the, the, a kind of a strange awkward social situation that is still stable until the point when the third person suddenly comes in you know, there's suddenly too many identities in the room, too many bodies in the room to be managed in, term of the, in terms of this identity. Like a, a, an explosion is just too many road shows and suddenly it's clear two of them are false, they just broke into the house, we are dealing with a crime. Yeah? Um, so uh, it starts critical, uh, it, it turns from a joke into a crime the moment that you have one, 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 one road show too many when the identity becomes unmanageable. Um, what if not only the identity becomes unmanageable, but at some point we do not even understand anymore what's being imitated, where the reference of the imitation suddenly becomes un totally unclear. Here we still have the moustache as a, uh, moustache as a reference. That's there, that's it. Unknown until it was spotted, first by fishermen off the coast of Indonesia in the 1990s. It looked like an octopus, but it could morph its shape in an instant to appear as seemingly any animal around it. At first, no one had any idea what it was. The first time I saw it, I just was blown away. You couldn't get a more spectacular animal. It really is the pinnacle of wizardry. Biologist Mark Norman was the first scientist to study this seemingly shapeless creature. He named it the Mimic Octopus. A mimic octopus makes itself look like a living, moving animal. So it pulls all its arms around behind its body and swims along like a poisonous flatfish called a banded soul. In other cases, if it's getting attacked, it puts six arms down a hole and raises the other two arms to look like a poisonous sea snake that has bands along its body. If that's not enough, it'll swim along looking like a poisonous lionfish with these banded arms looking like the banded spines that come off these very deadly fish. So far, 15 separate species are known to be in the Mimic Octopus Act, and Norman is not always sure exactly what the Mimic is doing. He observed this Mimic scuttling along the sea bottom, <laughs> looking something like a furry turkey with human legs. Sometimes it's hard when you watch a mimic octopus doing what it does to interpret what's going on. It's a bit like looking at ink spots in a psychiatrist's office going, uh, I don't know what that is, it could be a piano, it could be a fridge. So you get three or four divers together and you'll argue all night trying to work out what we think it was mimicking. Where did nature's greatest actor come from? But that's the moment, no? When it's not no longer clear what it's imitating. Is it a piano, is it a fridge? You have pure mimicry suddenly, you know? Something that is mimicry in a, in, a, in a key where it's both funny and scary because you have a fundamental confusion of identity. That little mimic thing is just purely mimicking, doesn't even know anymore uh, what it is. Yeah? And it gets wilder. I have to admit I was screaming when I got this video thing. What makes a marine biologist scream? After Hanlon captured this about 10 years ago, he was doing a study in the Caribbean and he'd been following this octopus for about an hour. When it crept behind the rock and went into camouflage mode, he jammed the camera down right in its face, so to speak, prompting it to go from camouflage to a startle defense. Blanching white very quickly and then inking him. But I followed the animal and finished the dive, and I popped at the surface, it was only about five feet deep, and I screamed bloody murder, and they thought I was having a dive accident. When actually, he was having... It was a eureka moment, there's no doubt about it. 
And that's because Hanlon is trying to understand just how camouflage works in cephalopods. Yes, cephalopods, squid, octopus, and cuttlefish. They are masters of optical illusion. They are the animals best known to go anywhere in camouflage. No animal comes even close to the speed, diversity, and appearances of this animal. And they have a few tricks at their disposal. Octopus and cuttlefish can change their skin texture. This is the only animal group we know of that has fine control of its skin to create the bumpiness. And they match their skin dimensionality by sight, not by touch, which is a vexing visual perception question. And of course, they change color. So here's an octopus. Doing what we call the moving rock trick. I'm a rock, I'm a rock. Now watch this. So the amazing thing is that these animals are colorblind, yet they are capable of creating color match patterns. But we don't know how. But of course, Hamlet would like to. And one way he's studying this is by looking closely at squid skin. That's what you're seeing here. These are super close-up images of live, unanesthetized squid. And those dots of pigment are called chromatophores. They come in three colors. Yellow, red, and brown. But there are reflectors under the pigments, and the reflectors produce the short wavelengths, the blues and the greens. And as you can see, the chromatophores can change shape to change the predominant skin color. Each one of those little spots on there can expand up to 15 times its diameter. And these chromatophores seem to be twitching all the time. They camouflage all night long. They don't sleep as far as we know. That's because cephalopods, with their squishy bodies, rely on camouflage as their main protection from predators. But of course, camouflage is not just color, it's also pattern. This is one of Hanlon's major hypotheses. We found only three to four basic pattern templates that they use to achieve all this camouflage. So there's uniform. By uniform, we mean that there's little or no contrast in the pattern. There's model. Model is small-scale light and dark splotches. And disruptive, and the idea there is... To interfere with the recognition of what the animal is. Based on lab studies, Hanlon says that the animals flash particular patterns based on a few visual cues they encounter in the environment. Hanlon wouldn't call it a reflex because so much visual analysis is involved. But it is very fast. The palette and pattern changing in less than a second. But just why these patterns work is still kind of a mystery. Let's take the octopus video again. Hanlon analyzes this video frame by frame, but he can't tell you why you don't see the animal. We can't find any true statistical matches, whether it's brightness, color, between the animal and the background. So camouflage is not looking exactly like the background. Camouflage just means fooling whatever's looking at you which suggests... We're uh, behind the eight ball, as it were, if we think the world looks like how we see it. There's much more information there, and other animals see it very differently. For Science Friday, I'm Flora Lichtman. So, two last steps in the argument. Um, to say, if we have this wild mimicry, a wild form of relating to the environment that is so wild that at some point you cannot even say what the original shape of the animal is because it, it's constantly in motion. You cannot say what the original color of the skin is because that thing is constantly transforming, constantly pulsing. Um, what kind of relationship to the entire environment uh, does that actually imply? What understanding of identity and difference are we looking at? The uh, canonical definition or explanation of this kind of mimicry, as he says in the beginning, is still camouflage. So crisis control, I want to survive, hence uh, uh, I blend in with the environment, with all the obvious social connotations. No, I don't want to kind of be caught out in society, I blend into the environment, I camouflage myself to pass. Um, this camouflage interpretation was then famously uh, challenged in the uh, surrealist magazine Minotaur in the 30s by Roger Colois, a philosopher, who wrote a fantastic uh, essay, Mimeticism and a Legendary Psychastin. Um, 
uh, psychasthenia. Um, and in this text, uh, uh, Roger Calois makes a famous argument, which is then later picked up by Jacques Lacan uh, as the basis of his theory of visuality and subjectivity, if you will. And Calois um, proposes the following argument. He says, like, um, if camouflage, if mimicry was really there to protect the animal, how come that in, in the stomach of predatory birds you find as many insects with these camouflage mechanisms as insects without? No, if uh, and you know in, in most cases if an insect sits still and birds go for motion detection that should so totally suffice. They don't need this kind of luxury uh, of camouflage because obviously it's not particularly working well. There's even cases where he says there's poor insects who actually mimic uh, the very leaves that they're eating, so which unfortunately then creates uh, um, uh, cases of unwanted cannibalism when the in insects start eating themselves because they can't tell themselves apart from the food <coughs> that they eat for. So basically then, um, Calois challenges the Darwinist assumption that all of that is uh, kind of geared towards crisis control and survival. He basically, he links it more to fashion and a decadent form of luxury. Uh, and he basically says that it, the, the um, insect is giving in to the seduction of space. So it's, uh, the, the insect basically surrenders to the lure of the environment to become one with the environment. And he actually calls it a kind of teleplasty. Uh, or like organic photo photography. I turn myself into a photograph of my own environment. Um, and basically Lacan premises his entire theory of visuality and subjectivity on this text by Calois, basically saying as we operate in society, well, we're constantly turning into ourselves, ourselves into photographies of our own environment as we're giving into the seduction of that field uh, in which we operate. So that in a sense, uh, the, the, the animal is not trying to survive, it's actually performing its own kind of a very strange, um, morbid desire of no longer having to be itself, but become one with its uh, environment. In that sense, uh, then Calois argues, all these animals are hysterics. Uh, they, they, all these animals perform libidinously uh, a form of identity transgression. They try to lose themselves in what he calls the seduction of dark space. Yeah? And he basically says the night is not like the day, the, the night is, is full of darkness, and these animals kind of give in to the seduction of this darkness by performing pleasurably a loss of identity, a totally radical becoming other, um, as a particular form of pleasure that has nothing to do with control and safety. Um, a radical, and which of course written in a surrealist magazine, then uh, almost is a proposition as to how an artistic transgressive activity could be understood, you know, as becoming radically other, giving into the seduction of a dark space by losing uh, whatever might be uh, an anchoring form of identity. Lacan actually goes so far and as describing painting in these terms. Uh, painting as something where you perform a, basically a skin trick. And in that sense, what Lacan says about painting totally mirrors what this marine biologist said about squid skin. You know? Now the canvas is the squid skin in which you mirror uh, the environment, but uh, basically to captivate, to trap the look of the other. Not to hide, but to arrest the look of the other um, as this, this, uh, um, nah, this moth does over there. And, um, Lacan does a, a, a variation on this idea, trompe le eux, to deceive the eyes, uh, to dompt le, le regard, lay down your gaze, as a way, lay down your weapon, lay down your gaze here. So where this kind of transgression of identity, the, the, the performance of an environmental relation on your skin, which is the canvas, in a way tries to seduce the gaze of others, to lay down their gaze, uh, on this uh, on this strange social skin that you are performing, you know? like where where the transgression of identity produces a membrane, the canvas, which is a social skin on which the other can lay down his gaze like he would lay down a weapon, you know? um, a particular form of seduction through radical non-identity and actually becoming the social canvas, 
like the entirety of the social canvas with absolutely no reserve. Uh, and I'm tremendously indebted to my friends and Henry and Maxwell, two fantastic artists from Canada, to whom I was talking last week, and, and she said, you should look at Maria Bamford, an uh, American comedian, who I think performs exactly that. She is someone who I find extremely unhamish. Uh, like she's not, she's a performer who doesn't anchor, uh, at least that's what I'm assuming, uh, her performance in a, in a stable sense of identity, but she actually becomes every woman. She becomes a kind of a strange social texture of voices that is partially funny, partially freaky, but definitely doesn't, is, doesn't do damage control. Uh, but performs a strange uh, social tapestry that asks you to lay down your gaze on the <laughs> always told me, she always said, listen, if a boy doesn't like you, okay, it is just because he is intimidated by your beauty, because you are the most beautiful girl in the whole world, and if you would stop doing impersonations of me, maybe other people could see that. <laughs> I like to do different voices in my act, because my own voice does not command the respect and the attention that I believe I deserve. <laughs> go to some fancy shop and say, hi, can I get some help? They'd be like, no, little girl. <laughs> We're not serving little girls today. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if I went in there and was like, hi, what's your name, Cindy? Cindy, I need to speak with your manager. Thanks a lot, sweetheart. <laughs> excitement. Miss the excitement waking up every day. I didn't know if I was going to go in and file something or <laughs> type something or like file something I just typed. <laughs> I decided that the worse the job is, the more excited the temporary representative seems to be about it. today. Five dollars an hour, Alpha America filing in an industrial warehouse. I thought of you first. <laughs> I kept expecting it to get worse. Hello, Maria. This is Judy. Tijuana, Mexico. Loading fruit trucks. You need to be there in a half hour. Corporate dress. <laughs> Hello, Maria. This is it. I have a feeling. Temp to firm Thailand. You are sold into prostitution. But there is free parking. <laughs> creepy boss and always come up to me and say stuff like <sighs> I really like it when you wear your hair like that <laughs> uh, why don't you come in the meeting uh, take shorthand cheer up the guys with their pretty face <laughs> come on smile for me you look so much more beautiful when you smile <laughs> office and say stuff like, hi, I really love the way your gray curly neck hair comes up over the edge of your peach, Polly Weiss, what stands for sure? Mm. Why don't you come in my cubicle and tell me more about my partial dental benefits after 90 days? <laughs> Smile for me. The fact that I net $6.49 an hour to provide you with the sexual stimulation you're not man enough to get in your personal life is so much more apparent when you smile. <laughs> I, uh, as I'm getting older, um, I realize all my dreams are not going to come true. My mom almost wanted me to be Miss America. And there's never been a Miss America whose talent has been stand-up. And I think I could have been a contender. As your Miss America, I travel to chuckle buckets all over this great country, spreading awareness about the fact that airline food is of a poorer quality than regular food. Hey, what's up with that? <laughs> 
girls out there on town to keep reaching for the stars because those are the only people who can help you. <laughs> and if someone yells at you to take off your top, you just say, hey, jackass, you're confusing a comedy club with the place where your mama works. Thank you! <laughs> sum this up, which maybe is unnecessary, but um, to some extent, how I would look at humor is a way of, almost as a psychonaut, as a traveler, uh, entering a zone, a twilight zone, where you sense all the spirits and demons that currently shape society and produce the social crisis uh, that uh, defines contemporary life. As, as you travel into this zone, like a medium, like a spirit healer, uh, one mission in this interzone, twilight zone of many, many spirits, many humors, many interstellar forces, one mission uh, can be damage control if you want. You, know, you somehow uh, find a way of containing all those spirits uh, in a joke, no credit today, tomorrow, no problem. So even if the crisis persists and all those spirits won't go away, at least for a moment you get a grip on it, you put the thing out there, you perform a very pragmatic t a trick that for the moment renders those spirits visible, uh, materializes them, and in that moment allows you to get a hold on things uh, and to entertain the community at the same time. Uh, a form of crisis management that is maybe not full on healing, but still I would say an alternative to the police. Uh, um, which I would always somehow to understand uh, also associated with the ham, the person who suggests, you know, I'm, I'm messing with all those demons, but still you can trust me I'm the guy, uh, and you know I, I don't want I don't I, I won't drop this glass of wine. So it's in safe hands, uh, whatever it is that I'm currently holding. But it's definitely in safe hands, um, which is fine. Good good crisis management, um, but obviously also very male coded as a. Um, and I would say even Sarah Silverman, when you watch her perform, she's doing a version of the ham. It's, it's still clear she's the kind of confrontative Jewish girl who's making this this. Uh, uh, these jokes, but it um, so. But we're going into the zone. We're getting out what we find there. We we, we hold it for a moment in the joke, uh, and for this moment, we, we we see the crisis. We get a grip on it. So at least the elephant on in the corner is, is kind of you know brought out by his uh, whatever you call it in English. Yeah? Um, um, first first way of looking at the comedian as this kind of sp spiritual psychonaut traveling in the in the twilight zone to control. The other, if we want to get away from the ham, I would suggest building a whole genealogy of a different reading um, of the pleasures of what has unfairly been called hysteria. You know, to un fully understand the beauty and professional ethos of someone like, uh, like uh, Blanche Whitman, the trajectory that goes from her as someone who can be everybody, who can perform every symptom and doesn't even have to bank on bringing it back to a safe point of the ham. Uh, and this kind of lineage that leads from Blanche Whitman to um, Maria Bamford, um, through a whole history of radical mimetic becoming, uh, where the assurance of a safe identity to be regained is not even to be given because the seduction of blurring in to the many environmental stimuli uh, is just much bigger and even more pleasurable. Um, so in this sense, I would strongly advocate a form of kind of wild becoming where you uh, stuff your mouth with many, many spirits and uh, allow them to drop from you um, from inside this twilight zone. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> I
time for questions with guys? Yeah, good um, on this scale of freaky to funny, and also in terms of mimesis, like pointing outside of it towards a universality, how would you situate um, Genesis, Genesis Purage? Yeah, amazing, though. Um, amazing, amazing. amazing. I'm, I'm not, I mean, I currently have a student in Rotterdam who's been working with him and, and he's a big fan and a lot of what I've kind of my, my recent update on Genesis P Orridge has come through him. Um, Genesis P Orridge used to be the singer in, in Throbbing Gristle and uh, performed, yeah, just the gen gender, how do you say that, gender transformation, gender shift uh, and uh, now says basically she, he, 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 she, he is the woman that he, she always loved. Uh, interestingly, while kind of approaching this with the kind of William Burroughs total kind of trashy, I'm just going to shoot whatever society's pathology is up my arm, kind of I'm going to jump myself with, with, with the symptoms of everything, he's still at the same time talking about healing and shamanism and doing courses in kind of spiritual drawing uh, 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 and understanding the necessity to produce kind of, I don't know, yeah, forms of healing and focusing through art, and in that sense would be an exemplary performer for what I'm proposing here. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, I mean, like at some point I started talking and use, started using the term transgressive, uh, which is something that is also part of the aura of someone like Genesis P. Orich. Uh, um, when in the end I'm not even sure to, to what degree I would push that into the realm of the kind of something that could be obviously understood as confrontatively transgressive or obscene. When what I find fascinating about this octopi is that that's what they do all day. And they're pretty relaxed about it, you know. It's not even it's not even that this octopus is overstepping any board boundaries. It is just what they do. Night and day they, they are in this morphing business. Yeah. Um, Another question, or that we usually associate this kind of fluid identity at some point with psychopathology, and I need to manage that, mm -hmm. which in kind of serious health cases might actually be the case, I don't know. But, but to, to, there is also something in this trajectory where it might be necessary to depathologize. I mean, like someone like Maria Bamford, she has these good kind of, you can find something on YouTube called the Maria Bamford Show where she basically says, you know, she had a breakdown in Hollywood on stage uh, and went back to her mother's house, uh, being treated for hysteria, and now she puts out that, that program. And it's not quite clear whether that is kind of fiction or real, but you even feel like she's taking this kind of stigma onto herself, say like, you, you are the kind of uh, wild woman that can be every woman, you must be hysterical, so she's playing that card, yeah. um, which I find, so basically she seizes the Blanche Whitman legacy, and by performing it, on the one hand, puts the stigma on herself, but then to a certain degree also exercises the pathology card. No? And, but that's also where I'm at a loss. No? On the one hand, I, I, I'm totally attracted to this wild mimicry, and I would actually like to see it outside the, what we have come to understood as transgressive and pathology. It's what an octopus does all day, the psychic octopus. Yeah? To understand that is the social, that is quintessential social behavior, that's a social animal. Um, but and of course, there's a limit where where it becomes unclear where where the term pathology and transgression comes in. Uh, yes. yeah, you mentioned the, the, the stigma of having that kind of pathology switching at all times and morphing, but um, or maybe the stereo of it not having one set personality yeah. in that way. But wouldn't you say that there couldn't you say as well that there's the other side of it that there's some kind of sexual selection going on as well that certainly in animals, but even in kinds of humans, that there might be some kind of performance aspect that goes on to, you know, show oneself, you know, as a particularly desirable type of person. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly, no, the, um, but there, there is, but again, the, the question is, on the one hand, um, it's total seduction, yeah? but in, in, in extreme forms, you would have the, the, the seducer who has, who always, tries to mirror the desire of the other, and then you get the talented Mr. Ripley mm -hmm. on a certain level, or like all the, a lot of Brad Easton Ellis characters, you know, where the American psycho is, 
but where, where the trajectory that is built in this analysis, of course, that the person who's the ultimate seducer also becomes a killer. Uh, where, where it's quite clear that this is not harmless, the talented Mr. Ripley will murder at some point. Uh, um, I'm, I'm unsure. Like on the one hand, you could say this is like the, that is precisely what, what defines uh, opportunism. Yeah? Somebody who will play up to any kind of desire, with no resistance, will just kind of uh, put a little bit of ma magical sparkle on it, so, and people don't realize that they're getting what they already had. Yeah? Uh, but just because there's the sparkle of the mirror that makes you feel like you just encountered something that you never met before. Yeah? <laughs> just when they're telling you to show me all these photos of girls and saying, hey, you know my work is about the encounter of the unknown. And it's like, yeah, what do you mean? Like, they all look the same. Yeah? <laughs> there's a kind of a strange thing going on where you could, on the, on the one hand, say this is ultimate conformism. Yeah? To always play up, to be the mercury in other people's veins and, and just channel other people's desires. Yeah? Um, the question is the difference between that ultimate conformism and a particular form of just being the social. Like Giorgio Agamben um, in, in the coming community, he, he speaks about the trickster as inhabiting the key of pure belonging. Not belonging to A, not belonging to B, just belonging as such. And with the mimic octopus, it is being like. Um, that's also what, what Calois says. No, it's not being like A or being like B, it's just being like. You live in the condition of being like, in a condition of belonging not to A or B, you are the social, social fluid. You are every woman. No? Um, and there is something, when, when that is realized as a, ra a radical position, where being like means there is no identity. Uh, where you're not playing into the hands of a particular taste, you just say, like, at the heart of society, what keeps us all together is non-identity. It's not like we are nation ABC and this is our identity, and this is how you should be. So that's the opportunity to perform who is, who is like you should be, versus someone who is like everything. And thereby makes it clear that at the heart of society, what we find is not identity, but non-identity. It's a bit abstract, but this idea of, like, Pure belonging, pure fluidity, constant translation, tr transaction, transbodiment, as that which makes society work. Yeah, um, I guess just going off of what you just said, what about um, something that's been like nothing at all? Um, you talked about Andy Kaufman briefly, and I just wonder. Um, you know, for me, he's kind of like the total other in a way because uh, he's not riffing on anything else. Whereas I understand that Maria Bamford is able to move kind of seamlessly between these different typologies, but she's still she's still using mimesis. And so I guess my question for you is: Is there a humor that exists outside of mimesis? Yeah. What, what do you think? Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. In, in what, what would be an example? Like you would say that Kaufman doesn't actually mimic. Yeah, I think it's really, really difficult. We've talked about Kaufman a little bit in class, and yeah. I think that we've all um, had a hard time kind of articulating what exactly he's doing. Mm. Um, I want to try to do that right now. <laughs> it seems like he's such a he's able to kind of uh, create such a kind of dissonant break with any kind of accepted code somehow. I, mean, I guess we watched the Mickey Mouse thing that is so famous for the Saturday Night Live, where he's just standing on stage <clears throat> and the record plays, and then he sings the the chorus. Mm -hmm. And it's as we were talking about, it's so hard to put together what's actually happening there. Mm -hmm. Like he's mimicking the voice, but like the the the, the, the crowd acknowledges that he can't. It's just a very bizarre, dissonant thing that it's also like an object unto itself. The, the whole setup, mm -hmm. right, with the record player and his yeah. different affects that he's doing. Well, I mean, is it pseudo-mimetic that is what's funny? What do you mean by that? That you are expecting to laugh because of the mimetic, but it's the um, mm -hmm. it's the it's the un it's the anti-mimetic <coughs> that actually what slips you. Yeah. I mean, the, what, what you said, no, like, is there comedy that is not mimetic? Um, 
I mean, the, the, the thing is, the moment you start theorizing, you very easily end up in this trap that you try to find something that is an answer to everything, uh, which, is, which is not what I'm trying to do. It's just one aspect, and I think what, what um, makes it profound is that, uh, no, I can't say Mexico, Jesus. I mean, <laughs> what I find attractive about it is, is that um, you suddenly realize that there is always something in society where, where this twilight zone exists, where, where you sense the forces, you sense the presences, and there's different ways of going into that zone. And in the traditionally a practice that has been disregarded officially under modernism. In modernism, we all represent, we analyze, uh, we no longer mimic, that's for children, as Adorno says. To say, no, no, but this mimetic practice lives on, for instance, in comedy, in magic. Uh, or, and and it's, it's a way of diving into this. I'm, I'm not denying that there's other forms of comedy. Yeah. It's just a way of um, going in there. And either to stabilize or to destabilize with Kaufman, and in, with Kaufman, not just, I mean, yeah, I trusted you, who I trusted you, who I trusted you, who <laughs> Like he's mimicking a rock star, but pushing this mimicry to a point where he's actually also playing on an effect. You know? That's kind of the, the mirror neurons, like by, by mimicking, we're exchanging emotions. We're assuring ourselves of our emotions. You cry, I cry, you tilt your head, I tilt my head. So there's a transfer of emotions, and what Andy Kaufman does is, is that, of course, he's, he's, he's just kind of playing a ping pong ball into this, and it's just like, ding, 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 and you no longer know on which emotional channel he's sending and what you're receiving. Yeah? I trusted you. Is this a joke or is this an insult? Is it because it's playing on this audience drama, like, I trusted you, the audience trusts the performer, the performer trusts the audience, and he's producing a disappointment. Because he's not coming up with any punchline, yeah, so he's invalidating the trust of the audience. At the same time, giving you mixed messages galore. Like, so, oh gosh, God, should we be caring of him because we've been treated him badly? We're not laughing, are we? So it's, he's on all those kind of emotional, on this map of the emotions, he's just kind of shooting, like he's, he's, he's loosening the cannon. No? Where, where, so on a certain level, I think my medic responses, and I don't want to extend it overly, is also like, this is how we pass emotions, no? Like, I respond to sadness with sadness, the happiness, and there is something in humor where you can either align the emotions or you can provocatively disalign the, the, the emotions, that you're laughing about something very sad, um, uh, um, or being, yeah, mi mixing these, these, these elements in, either in black humor um, or in something like Kaufman where this whole kind of, the, the, the canon just shoots over this entire map and the audience doesn't even know how to, what the mimetic response would be, what the appropriate emotion to show would be. Is it like shock? Is it care? Or the poor guy, we, 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 we trusted us, now we let him down. Or, or anger because he's letting you down because it's just, uh, freakishly annoying. Yeah. Um, so that, that's another element that where, where this mimetic math is screwed with. No? Yeah. yeah, so um, I guess given sort of the, the close relation between the spiritual and the comedy that you, you demonstrate, um, my question is to what extent should we take um, religious or spiritual objects seriously in art? Um, so how do we reconcile the reverence that we want to yeah. show religious or sacred objects um, with the sort of inherent absurdity that um, kind of lends the comedic elements to them? Wow. Yeah. So before I go on, like, what, do you have any intuitions or like, what's your position on that? Uh, no, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a little ambivalent, or not ambivalent, but more so I'm not sure if if I'm at a place where I can make those distinctions. So I, I sort of take things at face value or, or how I believe that the artist is intending for it to, to be. Yeah. And yeah, because of course religious objects command authority and laughter is always to a certain degree about challenging authority. You know? On that level of course we have a fundamental clash. You know? If, if the authority is, is challenged, it might, might be instantly interpreted as sacrilege. Uh, 
Right. So in, in an orthodox understanding of, of religion, to challenge the authority of the religious symbol is unthinkable because it's sacrilege. Yeah? That would be one canonical understanding. From there you could say, now this kind of debate with the Mohammed jokes done by the Danish cartoonist. Yeah? Yeah, this is sacrilege. The authority of the prophet is put into question. But then there was this brilliant remark by a British journalist, forgot the name. It's like, after all this debate, has anybody ever asked the question whether these jokes were even funny? Yeah. Um, and they weren't. No, they weren't, because straightforward sacrilege is not actually funny. Yeah. Uh, which would then point to the possibility of um, religious laughter. And if you go into someone like Georges Bataille, I'm really not an expert on George Bataille, but there's a whole kind of surrealist tradition where they want, where they go into the idea of religious laughter. Right? Like, what's the deepest mode line? I, um, uh, I don't want to spread any blasphemous rumors, but uh, six sense of humor, and when I die, I expect to find him laughing. Yeah? Um, which is the question: Is there religious laughter? And I think, uh, but Bataille associates that with shame basically says eroticism is unthinkable without shame. Uh, and that in the sense that relating to that which um, to which it's not quite clear how really to relate to it, the, the sublime object or the obscene object, that there could be something, if you drag it out fully, it's sacrilege, it's not funny, it's just blunt and stupid. But if there's a joke that actually is shameless and shameful, obscene and sublime, it might maybe be the most respectful way to relate to divinity, which is in an unorthodox way, you know, to, to, to have the prophet joking with the God in a sincere form of shameful shamelessness or something like that. And now, what I'm trying to get at is a beautiful essay by Giorgio Agamben in, uh, on, on, um, on profanation. It's a short essay in a book called Profanations. And basically, he's, he, he basically goes to, um, in modern times, we understand profanation just as sacrilege. So if you profanate, you swear, you, you insult the divinity. But he's saying in, in ancient Greek, uh, or an ancient ritual, profanation is actually not sacrilege because it's part of the official ritual. Basically, for instance, you consecrate a, a chicken to a god, and in the act of consecration, the priest will touch, let's say, the chicken liver and profanate it. Uh, which means that, okay, when the whole chicken has gone to the gods, the liver will be coming back from the gods to the community, so the community will eat the liver. So, uh, in that sense, it is part of the profanation and consecration are part of the same rhythm. Uh, which means that the profane share is that which you get back from the gods. So in that sense, the profanation of the religious thing is the moment when the community shares into something that would otherwise be put out of reach. And he's basically saying, for instance, that a lot of games, like for instance ball games, were once part of a religious riot, where playing ball was to symbolize the com competition of the gods over the sun, which we no longer know because we only perform the profane share of playing ball. And so that's, but we still perform it, you know, no basketball religiously. But so there is in the profane share, there is still the religion. Like everybody loves the Super Bowl because it's still the gods playing over the sun. So that, that is the moment when the religious meets the profane and in, in some kind of strange in-between territory. Where you could, I don't know to what degree you want to stretch it, but um, you would have to have a good example of a joke that is actually, um, profanating and somehow touching on something of sublime and observe it, preserving it in the same moment. And yes. So could that, you know, probably only come from, from a religious source or somebody who identifies with, with some sort of religion? Like I can't really imagine that coming from somebody who, who had no, no sort of reverence for that to begin with. Yeah, no, exactly. But reverence and irreverence are then kind of part and parcel of the same operation. No? To be truly unorthodox, you also have to be have the orthodoxy in your bones. You know? So I would say kind of Jewish humor is amazing at that. And also when you go through the history of um, 
Renaissance painting and Baroque painting, there is a lot of kind of really cheeky humor hidden in reverence. Like if you're in a Baroque church and you look around, you will always find a, little, a couple of really obscene jokes. Like I don't know, a fresco painter going on, la la la, okay, this is Jesus, Virgin Mary, okay, and this is me, and this is the mayor shitting in the corner. No? So there's always a <laughs> where, where you understand the difficult balance between reverence and irreverence is something really to be studied. Uh, or orthodoxy and unorthodoxy. I think some of that, the, the, the sharpest stuff is in there, which an orthodox person would understand as sacrilege, but which still is that you, you're negotiating value, and then you're still on another plane, and then, it's, then just banal banality, affirmation of banality. So we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. For those of you that have to run, if you want to go, you can go now, because I know classes are tuning over. But for those of you who want to stay, we have time for a couple more questions. So, Steve, I think you're next. Yeah. Um, it's like you're over all of it. Uh, so when you were talking about the, the kind of the ability of the comic, um, I like the performer to you know, distance um, herself from like, you know, actually saying what she's saying, and actually doing what she's doing. Um, it brought me to the, what was it, Mark Fisher's book, The Capital of Realism, where he's talking about the, you know, the shitty boss, who's like, ah, I'm kind of doing the thing that the shitty boss does, but he's actually also doing that, you know, he's actually making you work on Sunday or whatever, and um, that this, this sort of um, broadening of what we can kind of like uh, take it as humorous at work as um, uh, the, the ease by which we can distance ourselves from our own like um, you know, the, the true self, the thing that maybe like Andy Kaufman laughed. Yeah. Um, when it becomes all my thesis, then it, once there's consequences to that, you know, then does that even sort of matter? Is this all predicated? Is both humor and performance, etc., all predicated on there not being any consequence to yeah. what is said or done? And you know, which is perhaps I, I don't know I, how I feel about the possibility of that. Um, so how does that work when there is consequence, yeah, or yeah, what, what yeah, forces yeah. that shift? But I, I kind of hear two point, <coughs> two questions in this. Oh, oh, sure. like, uh, one, one the question of alienation and bad faith. Mm -hmm. Like you, people who kind of say one thing to another, which is non-identical with itself. So it would just kind of yeah, bad faith, false consci consciousness, that which makes society unbearable. No? Um, and the other is okay. What about responsibility? When we traditionally would link responsibility to someone, you know, being accountable, being there, saying like, you know, I, if you want to, yeah, I'm, I'm here, and if, if I screw it up. This is where you find me, like you can all be responsible by my name because I herewith declare that this is who I am. Yeah. Or like Lutheran, like Protestantism, as you say, well, you all this Catholic corruption, like we don't know what's going in and what's going out here. Like uh, Luther famously said, here steht und ich kann nicht anders, here I stand and I can't, can't be any otherwise. So, like anti corruption, Reformation, Protestantism, uh, responsibility, fair point. Yeah. Um, that the question is, is, is the comedian only managing the corruption of society and making it a little bit more bearable? Yeah. Sometimes I always feel, yeah, okay, British people have humor, Germans have revolutions. Yeah. And that's why we have, like, oh, humor is so underdeveloped. Yeah. Because uh, in, in Britain, the, the queen will always be the queen. And you know that the class system will never change. And so the only way you can get by is by being, uh, by being funny about it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of, um, it's not just gallows humor. It's, it's a way of, um, uh, you resign. You, know, that you resign, you know that it will never change. So you might as well make a joke about it. Yeah. So, so then in that sense, it's just kind of corruption management. Where somebody who says, I refuse to just be funny about it. Let's just throw the king out. Know, and start a communist revolution, Germany. Unfortunately, the fascists were there. Yeah. But um, uh, that's a way of saying, like, okay, we don't need a comedian to manage this. We need a revolution to blow this whole thing out of the water. 
would be one way to say it, though, that, that, that the comedian is always secretly somehow colluding with the alienation and the kind of bad faith, the schizophrenia of society. We laugh about it so that we can go on, go home and, and just continue. Yeah? Um, that, that's a way that you could just hurl out there as an attack on humor, as, as just, yeah, sustaining, managing bad faith. Um, not sure what to say against that. Yeah? It's a, it's a f forceful criticism. At the same time, and we were talking about that yesterday, there's a, a powerful book by Paolo Viano uh, called Multitude Between Innovation and Negation, where he's talking about the joke as an exemplary political move. Because the, the, the joke temporarily suspends the application of the rule. It's a misapplication. And it just shows that the norm is totally arbitrary. And you can always, you know, I remember once doing a conversation with Vito Akwanchi, and people were asking him, like, okay, what do you think the art can do? And he was saying, he, he was quoting the Marx Brothers, the police runs into, comes into the hotel room, uh, searching for the other guys, Groucho is there, and say, where are the others? And he says, no one's there. What do you mean, your table is set for four? And he says, that's nothing, my alarm is set for eight. Uh, um, so, so, and Akonchi was saying, okay, that's the political power of art, because you can suspend the definition of reality that's imposed on you and open up this freedom of action where you exit the code, you escape, and that's a political maneuver against the imposition of a particular demand or reality principle. And then you would have an agenda where it's not just affirming the status quo, but fundamentally suspending it, where every joke is a moment of civil disobedience. That's how Paolo Vienna would spin it. Responsibility, I'm not sure I'm half Protestant, so I have my Protestant mother on the phone, and I know that I you will find me under my name. Um, I, I agree with that. And I also, I mean, obviously, partially I'm voicing Deleuze and Guattari, speaking about this idea of kind of a revolutionary schizophrenia. Yeah. Um, again, but I, I, don't, I don't want to be kind of flirting, I don't want to be flirting with transgression, yeah. or kind of flirting with pathology, but when you have someone in the family who deals with these person, like schizophrenic issues, it's, it's a hell of a lot of trouble. So I'm not trying to deny that. Uh, um, at the same time, I believe, um, okay, we can allocate responsibility to individuals who should be mature enough to take it on. But there is something about this being every woman, being every main man, where the social facilitator can be socially responsible precisely because he's everywhere in, in everyone. Like the, the question of empathy. So empathy is not like I am me, you are you, but empathy is that risky business where you somehow you're feeling everybody and everything and trying to moderate the process from there. Which is very, very risky because if it, if it works, everyone's happy. If it doesn't work, then you're called a manipulator. Yeah? Um, but there is a field of social responsibility which is deeply, deeply social, where it's precisely not about fixed identity, but absolute fluidity, and that's traditionally empathy. You know? That's what the mother is doing, who's, who's kind of, who feels everyone and tries to kind of work it. Yeah? Um, and then when, when, when she's caught in the act, of course, she's the psychic octopus that says, like, mama, it was just you. Yeah? But uh, if, it, if it works, then you have a moment of fluidity that might arguably be the highest form of social responsibility. Yeah? But the problem is, of course, you don't have a fixed mandate. No? Because when you're working with empathy, you can either be dead on and just totally feel it and, 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 and change it, or you can be absolutely so incredibly wrong. Or wrong in the moment of being right, or the pitfalls of empathy. When you feel the anxiety of the others, you actually call it a force. No? You can be a, like you feel the bomb and you set it off. Yeah? Uh, all, the, all these kind of problems of empathy, but which has to do with kind of dissolving your personality into this kind of, into the space, so. and which is another model. So, yeah. And talking about this, this idea of like where the point of like sacrilege is and where it's sort of this balance between being within the space of the orthodox, within the orthodoxy, but then doing it 
enabling part of the unorthodoxy to be used as well. Yeah. I was thinking of this sort of thing of like the idea of the of seeing with Bataille and how usually when you have something that is like sort of the pinnacle of the obscene, it moves also into this category of the sublime. But yeah. the characters that there's sort of like the release then is a sort of like ecstatic realization that one might have through a religious moment as well. And sort of like the end of story, the story of the eye when you have, you know, the priest has been completely defiled and then the yeah. Eucharist is being like sort of desecrated with like semen and urine and you have this but through that, there's the same kind of ritual that is a using those, those complete like, traits of the orthodoxy in such an absurdly unorthodox way. But it, I feel it sort of like moves into that moment where it's not necessarily, not humorous by any means, but that you've reached this other, this other sort of like moment of some kind of transgression. Yeah. I mean, it brings up the very kind of difficult question of violence as well, or sacred violence, and I, I don't even want to go there because it's, it's such a, well, I, yeah, I mean, but not flirting with transgression and not flirting is one thing, and not flirting with sacred violence, as a lot of surrealists did, is, is even more difficult when you're starting to play with the, with the way how violence is used in, in religion yeah, or validated. Uh, and then we could talk about comedy and the insult, or like violent laughter. Or like really violent comedy. Um, I don't know. It's it, it, the thing that Agamben argues in this text, which makes it so powerful, is to say like we shouldn't necessarily think of religion as a place of fixed values, but religion as a dynamic ground for the production of values, where you're negotiating with the gods, you're bartering with the gods. Listen, God, I give you this chicken, and then can you give me the liver back? Yeah? And if you read, for instance, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of this kind of bargaining going on between God and the prophets, you know. I don't actually want to give you my son, shall I know? And then God says, okay, you can keep him. Yeah? So a lot of these are like Jonah saying, like, God, you know, I really don't want to go to Nineveh. Can you please just get someone else to tell them to have a better life? And then he runs and ends up in the fish and everything. It's, it's a constant kind of where, where, this, uh, where a lot of the kind of uh, pagan thinking of like the gods are also just kind of messing around, right? yeah? Like Zeus and Hera, it's just like it's 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 a it's, it's a soap opera. Yeah. They, I just read. Um, it's also with this elementary table where the biggest conflicts, of course, are with with them, with the elements that should rule each other out. Kind of, uh, how long is that up? Um, earth and oh shit, water and fire, and then earth and air. But Zeus and Hera is the marriage of um, shit. Um, what? <laughs> Water and fire is Persephone and Hades. Yeah, they are married, and when Persephone and Hades they have this difficult relationship, she moves in with him to the underworld for half a year, then it's winter, and then they fight, and she moves back in with her mother, and then it's summer. Yeah. In the same way that Zeus and Hera, of course, constantly are in like a constant fight. Yeah. Um, where, where you have an understanding of, of religion as something where the value is constantly in negotiation, is constantly clashing, uh, and the obscenity of the story, all the things that Deuce is doing in different animal shapes, uh, to, to kind of together with his kind of supposed divinity. So you have more like the religion not as a place of sick, fixed values, but one where, where it's constantly negotiated. And hence a lot of kind of strange humor in the Old Testament that could be brought out in unorthodox in a deeply informed, so basically the cheeky rabbi and rabbi knows that the knows the knows the knows the, the scripture best uh, mm -hmm. because he can read the ironies out of that relationship that the prophet would traditionally have in his kind of conflictual relationship with God. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, um, so yeah. Time for one more question. Yeah, I'm just curious what you what you would say about loneliness. Um, sort of with the comic and also the, the mimic squid because it, in the clips we saw the squid or the octopus was by itself and uh, you know I wonder what would happen if it encountered another octopus um, and they, they were confronted with the same ability uh, but also thinking about pathology and the line between pathology and, and uh, yeah. normalness that it requires the observer yeah, yeah. Or like the straight man in the Marx Brothers clip there's there's the straight man and yeah, people yeah. copying him. Um, I mean, this, this, I don't remember this childhood joke. What, 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 what happens when octopi marry? 
it go to, goes through life hand in hand in hand in hand in hand in hand. <laughs> but, um, but, um, I'm going to start from the back with the third person. No? It's one, one argument that's very powerful that, that Paolo Virno develops based on Freud. And he says a joke is the constitutive moment of a society because it takes the third person. It takes one to tell the joke, one about whom the joke is, and one who laughs. Because the joke teller takes a risk and doesn't know if it's funny or not. So it, it, it needs the person, the witness. Without a witness, there is no humor. Because I, can, I, I do not know, I cannot say, no, I'm going to say something funny. But it, it, takes, it takes you to say it and then the witness to hear it, otherwise there's no humor. But if you have three, you have a society. No? And so, so the, the, the humor is constitutive of society because it needs the third person. It is a kind of a contract that is, is kind of not just one against one, but it is yeah, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah? So it, it needs to be a dynamic I'm not saying three sons, but a, 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 a triad <laughs> relationship. Um, hence, a kind of like a constitutive moment of the social. Yeah? Um, and hence, we also get out of this kind of dumb drama of me and the other, because it needs a kind of more dynamic situation. Yeah? That's one model. The other thing to say, like, okay, um, on the one hand, going with the, with the social squid, you could make a radical claim for for the um, dissolving into alterity, like a radical form of social being, and a defense of, of being social. We're so radically social, it's so social that it doesn't. It's beyond manners. Um, you could kind of develop that out of it, uh, and then if you read Hannah Arendt and her idea of speech and action and political action, is is you know taking the risk to expose yourself to others, not knowing what the others will see in you. So like, like surrendering to this otherness as a, poli as, as a kind of a commitment to politics. And, and she is a radically kind of social thinker. You know what I'm saying? Like going back to the Greek idea that someone who stays by himself is an idiot. That's the original meaning of idiot. Yeah? Someone who doesn't communicate and cannot be communicated with, antisocial is idiotic. Yeah? But I don't want to even push it into that direction because um, as we know, the idiot, like the being the idiot, playing the idiot, is also funny. Yeah? And in, in this, in this, I think ideally, if you don't want to go into some kind of strange moralist, all you have to be for other people, uh, or on the one hand, or the heroicism of all the artists has to be solitary and alone, on the other. So neither the moralism nor the cult of the transgressive solitary artist, but to say basically, we don't even know what it means to be by yourself and to be with others, because what there is a level of social reality that precedes it, uh, where you can be every woman even when you're alone by yourself, in the same way that the octopus can be every element. Uh, so it's not it's not a matter of like are you with yourself or are you with others, because the con the fundamental condition of being and belonging is maybe not even contingent on how many people are in a space. Uh, that the octopus can be the entire sea bottom to entertain itself if it wants to. So, um, so it, it, it could also be a way of exiting the compulsive logic of either the social moralism and saying that, well, you have to get a political view with other people, it's not healthy to be by yourself, yeah? or the other way, oh, the great artist is only when he's speaking to himself on the mountain top. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> maybe we should, we should abandon both of these models and say that we don't even fully understand what, what the difference is, because in, in some of the most potent ways of entering the twilight zone of the social unconscious, that there is what, what being alone and what being with many spirits means is, is still to be determined in a moment of practice. So I, I would more push it to, to that direction. Because I'm equally bored with the moralism as with the heroic thought. Thank you, Johan. That was good. Yeah. Oh, and I wanted to show you this. This is like in terms of pretty things that the Dutch, the Dutch Queen has just stepped down and they put on this magazine by her son. Oh, uh, you know, oh. uh, oh, <laughs> about social schizophrenia. <laughs> They're into buying and selling. <laughs> <laughs>